As I just said, our topic today is understanding creation, what are the meanings and implications of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, we're studying the book Understanding Creation, uh, which is uh, edited by uh, Jim, uh, James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. And uh, there are 20 chapters, which are intended to be standalone. And uh, they were originally planned to be 1,800 to 2,400 words, and I think this one actually keeps within that range as well. Uh, the uh, uh, person who wrote it is uh, Mark de Groot. And uh, for those of you who don't know Mark de Groot, uh, he studied astronomy at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And uh, obtained a doctorate in 1969 and then worked at the uh, European Southern Observatory in Chile. And was director and senior research associate at the Armagh University, uh, pardon me, Observatory in Northern Ireland. Uh, Andrews University gave him an honorary uh, science doctorate. Uh, and he entered the ministry in 1997. He's presently semi-retired, but pastors a Seventh-day Adventist church in Northern Ireland, and he's published a lot. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> to just give you my summary of, of the chapter to begin with, he gives a good general in overview of the Big Bang Theory. Um, but there are two sections that he talks about problems. So he really discusses the uh, problems. Uh, he gives an Adventist perspective um, that uh, uh, he gleans from Davidson. And he finishes with a critique of naturalism, which, as I read it, kind of didn't actually flow from the rest of it. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, you can observe for yourself, but at least the way I see it, he never really says for sure whether he believes in or whether he thinks we should believe in the Big Bang or the associated time frame. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, he doesn't give any alternatives to the Big Bang. I shouldn't say that. There's one area where he just kind of very briefly mentions uh, an alternative, but basically not. And particularly, he doesn't criticize the time element. Uh, he doesn't, he explains it, but doesn't uh, necessarily uh, say he accepts it either, but he just, he kind of uh, leaves that. His uh, chapter starts with a quotation from uh, Reader's Digest. Uh, if I understand you correctly, said the student after the professor had explained the Big Bang Theory of the Universe. First there was nothing, and then it exploded. <laughs> and uh, sort of a lighthearted way of starting out. Um, <clears throat> and his introduction is it talks about a few centuries ago when natural scientists saw in their object of study the working of a powerful sovereign god. Um, and almost sets up the critique of theism in science. Because this God's actions could be invoked when science was unable to provide answers. And specifically, uh, although he doesn't mention it here, Newton was criticized for uh, figuring that God periodically adjusted the planetary orbits so that they stayed uh, reasonably uh, uniform. Um, and uh, since advances in science provided answers to many of the formerly unanswered questions without invoking God, scientists began to believe they would ultimately be able to answer all the questions through the correct application of purely naturalistic methods and reasoning. Um, and I suppose the two that probably made that uh, most famously are Laplace, who figured out that uh, 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 with the uh, several bodies orbiting at the same time that there would be uh, a point at which they uh, 
they would destabilize and then they would restabilize orbits. And then, uh, of course, Charles Darwin, who argued that you didn't need God to account for the appearance of design in nature, and specifically in life. And you see, once you've answered some of those questions, you begin to think you can answer all of them. Um, the Big Bang Theory of the Origin, Development, and Structure of the Universe, and he defines the universe in that note, is the result of science's efforts towards this goal. So science, coming from explaining nature as the results of a powerful God, eventually wound up using natural explanations as a way to exclude God from nature. All scientific disciplines focus on nature of the earth and life based on the study of matter in all its forms. Big Bang Theory claims to provide an explanation for the origin of matter that is studied in these disciplines. As a result, Big Bang cosmology has become an all-embracing envelope, providing a framework not only for the study of the physical universe, but also for all natural science disciplines. <coughs> However, the Big Bang is more than a cosmology. It is also a philosophy based on a naturalistic worldview. And here he refers to um, chapter one of the book um, on, on worldviews. So he sees the Big Bang as not just a theory of how the universe came about, but also kind of a philosophical uh, way of looking at things. Uh, and this becomes the first of two <coughs> sections on the problems with the Big Bang Theory. He does set forth the theory and uh, basically it started in, 19, in the 1920s and 30s when uh, Edwin Hubble discovered the redshift and then people figured out that the redshift was most likely caused by the expansion of the universe. And of course if you turn that around um, the universe must have once been s much smaller and is now expanding at high speed. And if you project that backwards, and Stephen Hawking finally showed that it isn't, doesn't come to a near miss and then a, a, a re-expansion if you continue to go backwards, which would mean that going forwards you would come almost collapsing and then expanding out, that in fact it comes down to a point. Um, this interpretation of the redshift is one of the pillars of the Big Bang Theory. And other interpretations are possible, but somewhat speculative. Uh, that, that light gets tired going across uh, uh, the vast expanses of space and slowly loses frequency is one of the uh, possibilities that he doesn't outline, but is there. And then he has this interesting note on number four, which is the distance to a galaxy is estimated by the amount of shifting of the light. That after a point, instead of trying to figure out how bright the galaxy is, you just take the redshift and call it, that's the distance. Which means that the redshift is pretty reliable when tested to begin with. Because they finally just uh, uh, use the it, it eventually becomes circular is what happens, except that when you have something that has been correlated well enough that it, at a certain point you start using the correlation as a measurement itself. He then talks about the cosmic microwave background radiation. And the radiation is considered to be emitted some 370,000 years after the Big Bang when radiation decoupled with matter so that it could pass through matter without having to uh, get tangled up in it, basically. And um, interestingly, he outlines something, and, I'm, and I wish there was a note here or something that would tell you why, and maybe one of you more astronomically oriented people can help us with this. Galaxies in the local group of which our Milky Way is a member are moving at a velocity of 600 kilometers per second with respect to the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
this fact is at odds with the, the uh, cosmic microwave background radiations observed isotropy. And I guess probably what I should do is look in and see if, what the note there says. Um, that the radiation is the same value when measured from different directions. That is, if we're moving through it, you would expect it to be um, a higher frequency coming from one direction than from the other. And um, the direction that we're heading should, uh, should have a, a blue shift and the direction we're heading away from should have a, have a red shift and apparently that's not the case. But we're still moving with respect to it and I'm not sure how you determine that. That's the question that I have. He said this could be caused by a super strong gravitational attractor that has not yet been satisfactorily identified. Um, so people have proposed apparently a kind of a fudge factor to make this work. Um, you're going to see more fudge factors as we go along. The theory's third pillar lies in the abundances of the chemical elements, specifically the ratio of hydrogen to helium, which accords very well with the theoretical calculations. However, these calculations depend on parameters such as the ratio of photons to baryons, that is, units of light to units of matter, such as atoms. Um, specifically, baryons are the nuclei of atoms. Um, because these parameters cannot be measured accurately, they enter into the equations as free parameters, which are variables that are used in order to define a theory well enough to make a prediction. Which means that, yeah, if you adjust all of the numbers right, you can get what we've got. But that's adjusting the numbers, so I'm not sure how much weight you can put on the, uh, the ratio of hydrogen to helium. Our inability to verify the values of these variables by observations means that they are subject to a high degree of uncertainty. In other words, the, the variables... Um, <coughs> Uh, ratio of photons to baryons is, is something that uh, can be played with to make your theory match uh, the observations, which means your theory isn't really predicting anything at that point. Um, and then he has another section called perplexing problems. In the last 30 years, a number of other perplexing problems with the Big Bang Theory have come to light. The isotropy, that's, it's the same in all directions um, without uh, significant large holes or strong uh, uh, spots, uh, implies that matter and energy are very evenly distributed in the universe. This, can make it, this makes it difficult to explain how galaxies can form. If everything is all diffusely even, there's nothing to collapse into. And whether by a grouping of stars or by whether stars form inside existing galaxies. A second difficulty is the horizon problem. The uh, cosmic uh, microwave background radiation's isotropy suggests that widely separated parts of the universe have the same temperature because they're giving the same radio frequency and energy density. Although they are too far apart to for radiation from these parts to have reached each other within the lifetime of the universe, which means that it's all even, even though there's no way to adjust it so that it could become even. So this is the flatness problem, which deals with the exceptional fine tuning of the universe's mass density. A slightly imperfect fine-tuning would signify that the universe would have either collapsed long ago, if the density of matter were too high, or dispersed too rapidly for stars to form if the density of matter were too low. Fine-tuning requires a precision about 1 in 10 to the 55 is being quoted, and he gives a reference, and raises the question of how to explain this or extraordinary coincidence, which is precisely the necessary one for human life to exist. Um, in order to solve these problems, Alan Guth proposed the concept of inflation, and he has a reference for Guth. At the extremely high temperatures of the very early universe, gravity would have been a repulsive f 
force, instead of attractive, making the universe expand for a fraction of a second at speeds much greater than the speed of light. And when we're talking about much greater, <laughs> we mean like orders of magnitude greater. Inflation, because it suddenly expanded like that, solves the problem of galaxy formation, the horizon problem, and the flatness problem. Because everything got pushed apart at a relatively even rate, and that makes everything kind of even all the way through. That's the flatness problem. And the horizon problem at the same time. Um, problems remain, however. The most important and annoying of these is that the inflation predicts an energy density that is exactly at the critical level between an eternal expansion and premature collapse. This expansion of the universe is governed by its mass density. Observations show that the amount of detectable matter in the universe is less than 10% of that required for a flat universe. And again, he gives a reference. This is the problem of the missing or dark matter. The favorite answer to this question is that most of the mass of the universe uh, consists of exotic dark matter that does not consist of protons and neutrons. That is, it's not ordinary matter of the kind we talk about. You know, the hydrogen, helium, and, and so forth. Ideas abound about the nature of this matter, but none seems to provide a satisfactory answer. Which means we, have, we live in a universe where we can't see, feel, taste, or touch over 90% of what's really there. Maybe that's where angels live? Um, <clears throat> gravity will slow down the expansion of the universe, but observations show that a large, uh, at large distance, it is slowing down less than expected. So the, uh, the universe is being pushed apart somehow. The implied force reducing the slowing down is described by the cosmological constant, lambda, and is equivalent to a uniform energy density that exerts a repulsive force. Part of particle physics has no explanation for lambda, but calculations have been made on the strength of the inferred force necessary to explain this so-called vacuum energy density thought to be present in the universe. So they did the calculations, and they indicated that the repulsive force should be about 10 to the 120th times larger than the observed effect. In other words, you're not seeing near as much of it as you expect on the rate of slowing down. This enormous disparity between the calculations of the force required and the observed effect led Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg to quip, this must be the worst failure of an order of magnitude estimate in the history of science. Well, <laughs> certainly, if not the worst, it's very, very close. Uh, you're off by a factor of 10 to the 120th. Uh, <clears throat> Besides its uh, scientific problems, the Big Bang Theory also poses problems of a philosophical nature. So here he's criticizing the philosophy that, like all physical theories, the Big Bang Theory rests on a number of assumptions one must make in order to have an explanatory framework, framework for one's uh, observations. Cosmological principle, sometimes known as the Copernican principle, states that on a sufficiently large scale, all observers, whether located in the, wherever located in the universe, see the same features that we see. In other words, you're not at the edge of the universe looking in and uh, all dark on one side, for example. Um, <coughs> the cosmological principle has been postulated to provide the required explanatory framework. It includes the thesis that the laws of physics as we know them from our terrestrial studies that we see here on Earth are likewise valid at every location in the universe. While this assumption must be made to be able to do any extraterrestrial physics, if you don't have that rule, what do you do with physics? Uh, there's no logical reason why it should be true. Maybe the universe isn't the way we think it is. And then he discusses remarkable coincidences. Besides the apparent fine-tuning required to solve the flatness problem, there are number, uh, another hundred instances where physical quantities and other conditions of nature 
are found to be precisely fine-tuned so that life as we know it can exist. And here he quotes Hugh Ross. Um, this can be seen as a strong indicator of the existence of an intelligent designer interested in population, populating Earth with human beings. And interestingly enough, this intelligent designer cannot have its um, intelligence dependent upon the arrangement of matter because, at least not matter in our universe, uh, because this intelligence existed before the universe started. In addition, the location of the Earth in the universe is such that it provides the best possible platform for discovering the universe's characteristics. And here he quotes uh, Gonzales and Richards, the privileged planet. The Earth is not only set up for life, which the anthropic principle might be able to explain, but it's also set up for discovery, which there's no need for us to be able to understand the universe. Um, and that's given to us gratis. In other words, to do cosmology, Bible passages such as Psalm 19.1, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and Isaiah 40.26, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens, uh, lead Christians to think of God as the creator who shows himself through his handiwork so that we may know and love him. And of course, the beginning of space, time, and everything that the Big Bang points to cannot fail to bring Genesis 1-1 to mind. Note, however, that in the beginning does not give us the precise, I assume that he's talking about the biblical record, does not give us a precise chronological information other than to point to a period of time prior to creation week some 6,000 years ago. And uh, uh, he quotes Davidson on that, which means that uh, uh, Davidson at the seminary is, uh, argues that uh, the creation of the universe did not coincide with the 60 creation of the world. Um, <coughs> implications. The universe's isotropy could be considered evidence that the Earth is at or very near the center of a spherically symmetric universe. But of course, with the cosmological principle, you can't accept that. Since this idea might point in the direction of a god who had a special purpose for his creatures, and uh, interestingly enough, he, he cites Ellen White for that, it is scientific anathema. Interesting statement. The reason we don't accept uh, this kind of cosmology is because, because it might point to God. The cosmological principle avoids this conclusion and places the Earth in a general random location in the universe, just like all the others. However, there are theoretical arguments why the cosmological principle may not be valid in the as yet unobserved outer reaches of the universe. And he cites Eisbart for that. If observations prove this to be true, then cosmology of the remote, remote universe would cease to be a science and perish the thought, degenerate into speculation. For the Christian, this may not be a problem if, for example, God has seen fit to isolate our part of the universe from the rest of creation because of the presence of sin. Although it seems like uh, four light years is, is plenty of, uh, uh, of quarantine at this point. Klaus Eisbart makes this a perceptive statement. Ultimately, science uh, consists of human activities, and we may describe these activities <laughs> as scientific because of their aims and the way aims are pursued, without having to say that the aims are in fact realized or can be realized. In this sense, cosmology constitutes a science, but it would not make sense to regard cosmology as a science if it tries to pursue aims that can obviously not be fulfilled. Which means that a lot of cosmology is, uh, you're, we're playing with things that we assume are there and we don't really know. And he's, again, he uh, cites the same Icebart uh, article. A good example of this situation is the introduction of the idea of a multiverse. 
the supposed existence of a very large collection of different universes, each with their own characteristics. If these characteristics were the result of random circumstances, it would not be impossible for our universe to be just right for life. This is one form of the anthropic principle, which says in general that the properties of the universe must be such that life can exist in it. If it were not so, we would not be here to talk about it. And of interest is that uh, Tipler, of Barrow and Tipler, has become a Christian, and specifically over this argument that he finally said, look, we're fighting the anthropic principle. It's obvious that it points to a designer. As I write this, there is considerable discussion in Adventist circles about the order and time frame of God's creative acts. One scenario especially popular among evangelical Christians is, the, uh, is that, I, that my, I must have done a misprint on that, of theistic evolution. God directed evolution's progress from simple to complex and bridges difficulties like the origin of matter and life. Edward Zinke has given a clear theological exposition of how theistic evolution gives a picture of God's, a God at odds with the biblical description of his attributes. So he takes kind of a swipe at, uh, at uh, theistic evolution. Uh, Richard Davidson, which he appro uh, approves of more, provides a short and to the point discussion where among other scenarios he summarizes the traditional view. Uh, that is the initial unformed, unfilled state of the earth as follows. God is before all creation. There's an absolute beginning of time with regard to this world and the surrounding heavenly spheres. God creates the heavens and the earth, but they are at first unformed and unfilled, and presumably for uh, several billion years. Um, on the first day of the seventh day creation, we, God begins to form and fill. God accomplishes his work in six success, successive literal 24-hour days, and God rests on the seventh day, blessing and sanctifying it as a memorial of creation. So you have a creation event. Um, and that happened some billions of years after the universe itself was created. But it was a relatively recent creation event, and it did take, in fact, seven days. A universe that is unformed and unfilled, um, perhaps the, the best way to put that is um, in Genesis 1-2, and the earth was void and without form as the, uh, I believe the King James translation of it, uh, Hebrew is tohu wabohu. Um, and the meaning of that is not really clear um, Jeremiah talks about the earth becoming tohu wabohu again. And other than that, those words don't appear in the uh, Hebrew Bible. So we are left to kind of try to understand what tohu wabohu actually means. And Davidson's understanding, if I understand it correctly, is that uh, tohu is taken as unformed and bohu as unfilled. And wo is just the Hebrew and. And, uh, and the idea is that the, the picture in creation is at first you have the forming of light, the uh, firmament, and the land. And then you have the filling of light, or the forming, if you like, of the light into sun and moon, and by the way, the stars. Um, 
and you have the filling of the air with birds of the firmament, if you prefer, because that's actually the, the word that's used is the one that's translated firmament. And you have the, um, and then finally you have the filling of the land with land animals on, on day six. And so you have, a, you have a picture of something that's being done in an orderly fashion. Um, and and uh, that's what he's talking about, I think. And that's what he's saying Genesis is talking about. And this is kind of a traditional Adventist picture. His conclusion now shifts, at least in you know where I would where I would have gone because I've discussed all about the Big Bang, but now he starts talking about naturalistic science, which works within a paradigm, simply stated as all there ever was will be our mass, energy, time, and motion. This paradigm is embedded in a uh, naturalistic worldview where any role for God has been excluded from the start. Uh, as a result, attempts to understand the obviously non-material aspects of life on this planet, love and hate, joy and sadness, conscience and beauty, etc., in purely scientific terms are doomed to failure. Uh, neither are deeper questions of life addressed. This has not stopped naturalistic scientists trying to understand them in purely naturalistic terms. And here he cites uh, Dawkins, uh, um, uh, The God Delusion. Uh, but these explanations, if that's what we should call them at all, are often contrived, devoid of proper and valid fundamental principles, and therefore unacceptable. Uh, philosopher Bertrand Russell stated, what science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. Um, limiting our knowledge to science. I'm glad that God tells us about many aspects of the universe that lie outside naturalistic science. Leading cosmologist George Ellis wrote, we are unable to obtain a model of the universe without some specifically cosmological assumptions which are completely unverifiable. And he says at the end, awesome confession. That is, our models, really, we really don't know. And of course, say, citing Russell and Ellis. My, my own take on this is that one gets a good understanding of both the Big Bang Theory and some of the major problems with that theory in a kind of a general way. Of course, it helps if you're familiar with it before, but it's, it's a review and reasonably adequate one. De Groot criticizes naturalism without explicitly saying that the Big Bang is naturalistic. I'm not sure that I blame him because the Big Bang occupies an interesting uh, position in the argument uh, between what some people would call science and what they would call religion. And that is, it's actually good evidence that the universe had a beginning. And that not only the universe, but space and time had a beginning. And that asking what God was doing for the eons before, there were no eons before. There is no before. Um, on the other hand, the Big Bang also is one of the things that has been used to argue that the biblical picture is obviously incorrect. Because, Obviously, the time frame of the universe, you know, if you're looking at a, uh, at a uh, galaxy that's 100 million or a couple billion light years away, that means the light left it a billion years ago. And the only ways around that, which he hasn't really dealt with specifically, and uh, which I presume that he wouldn't necessarily defend are to try to propose that we're seeing illusions that they're really not that far away or that um, 
Light traveled faster in the past than it does now. That's, I think, the way of uh, Setterfield. Or that uh, life on this planet was relativistically, or time on this planet was relativistically slowed so that they really are that old by their reckoning, but not by ours. That's the way that uh, uh, Russell Humphreys of the ICR does it. And it's really probably the single toughest question to answer from, for somebody who maintains that the entire universe is only 6,000 years old. Big Bang Theory has been used to argue for a creator, and this idea has been fought by appeal to an unobservable and completely unscientific multiverse. There's no, no way of testing that theory. Um, this is not the test case that I would use. To, uh, I would not use, uh, try to criticize the Big Bang uh, strongly uh, because it's kind of, in a way, a two-edged sword. And the way of Davidson, it seems to me like a, a reasonable way out of, uh, that uh, would make sense. Now, I will hasten to say that the theory may still turn out to be false. You'll notice that there were a number of fudge factors that have been put in that really don't have any, uh, the inflation. What caused the inflation? We have no clue. Uh, and the inflation is needed so that the universe can be relatively smooth. The, um, uh, then you have dark matter which is needed so that the universe will be on the knife edge of expansion, which is where it needs to be. But what we're saying is that if you look at it, it doesn't look like there's enough matter. So there must be enough matter anyway, and we just can't see it. Um, I mean, you talk about a total fudge factor. <coughs> and then now we're looking at the universe, and it's not slowing down as much as it should be. Well, maybe because that's because there isn't enough dark matter. But maybe it is because there is enough dark matter, but there's an extra dark energy pushing things out. As you look at this, you, you start getting the feeling that, that whenever there's a problem, you can always find another fudge factor to work on. And uh, at some point, I start saying, you know, this is kind of weird. I say this also as a person who started out believing that the rocks were old on Earth and then finding that there's really not that much evidence for that. That uh, not, only, not only the uh, uh, life on Earth, but also the material of the Earth itself, the, lar the best arguments for uh, there being material on the Earth, in my opinion, are starting to uh, weaken very rapidly. Uh, they have to do with uh, how fast radiometric decay can ha take place. And so the theory, it may be that we should be even more conservative than we are. So the theory may still turn out to be false. Um, that doesn't mean I want to prematurely criticize it, and I certainly don't want to premature criti uh, prematurely criticize somebody who holds it, um, and, uh, but who accepts the rest of the Genesis record. And that's how I see the subject and how I see uh, De Groot's presentation of it. And now I will turn the... Uh, uh, time over to you. I have a couple of comments here. I've, I've heard a speaker mention that the word for create in a Genesis is similar to a word in Revelation, which uh, implied that uh, God would be recreating the earth anew and suggested that the word in uh, Genesis should be actually in, uh, translated that God recreated the earth. 
and I was wondering whether you would, uh, from your Hebrew background, had any uh, any uh, speculation on that. Well, I I'd be a little reserved on that, and and the reason why is because uh, in Hebrew uh, the word bara, which is used uh, used in uh, Hebrew in uh, Genesis one, is is often claimed, and I think you can make a good case for it, that it is created basically out of nothing. Um, and that's, that's the, the Hebrew word that I think they're referring to. But the, um, the word in Revelation is not even in Hebrew. It's in Greek. So unless you can make some kind of a good connection between uh, the Hebrew word that's used uh, in Genesis 1 and the Greek word that's used in, Genesis, in uh, Revelation, I think I'd be really, really careful about that. To my knowledge, and that may be limited, the, the translation of bara is not that much different from the translation of asa, which is the word that's usually used for made, uh, commonly out of something else. Like a potter makes a, uh, a, uh, a vessel out of a piece of clay. That's asa. <coughs> um, they may be right. But I think the linguistic support for it is likely to be thin. Uh, I'd have to see exactly what the argument is, but my my initial reaction would be skepticism mm -hmm. towards that. Yeah. Uh, j just from a historical standpoint, uh, I guess it's good history. Uh, Several years ago, uh, Martin de Groot was here on Loma Linda, gave several lectures at our creation conference we held in uh, Gentry Gym. Uh, he did a wonderful job. Uh, <clears throat> his, uh, I respect him very much. Uh, when I wrote a chapter on uh, the fine-tuned universe, uh, very aware that this was not my specialty, uh, I sent the chapter to him in a, he did the most wonderful job of uh, helping me out and uh, making sure that what I said was correct. Uh, perhaps more on uh, the broad aspect of this whole issue, uh, it's interesting that uh, Anthony Flew mentions the, the Big Bang as one of the uh, factors that converted him from atheism to theism. And uh, I presume it's especially this flatness problem, the exactness there, it, it seems there's got to be something. I mean, it, these figures are just too, too precise to uh, think they just happened uh, coincidentally. But uh, and I very much appreciate uh, Martin de Groot's uh, caution about the Big Bang. And he, he's been this way uh, all the time. And uh, I think he's... Uh, wise in doing this. You know, there's an aphorism that uh, cosmologists are often in error but seldom in doubt. And uh, it tells you a little bit about the speculative nature of this. On the other hand, I uh, might mention that uh, there are about five or six texts in the Bible that talk about God spreading the heavens out. And uh, this uh, Sounds like it, expansion. It does, and uh, so the, some of these a some aspects of the Big Bang theory uh, may be very correct. And uh, his uh, Mark de Groot's uh, evaluation at the end, I think, is is, is good. That uh, uh, Big Bang is interpreted in a naturalistic context, but uh, he did not mention that, uh, at least I don't, I haven't read the whole chapter he wrote, he did not mention that uh, 
some think that at, right at the beginning of the Big Bang, naturalism has to go out the way out the window, and you have to, in some, imply well maybe it's God, type of thing. And this uh, aspect, I wish you'd added that to the chapter, because it uh, you you can't. You have to give up, you know, you talk about these uh, singularities and so on at the beginning. Uh, it, it does give you an opportunity to uh, say, hey, uh, the Big Bang has a major flaw right here, and that is the beginning. Well, it has a major flaw if you're trying to interpret it as the laws of science apply for all of matter and all of the universe uh, at all times. Uh, because at the very point at which the Big Bang started, the, the equations go to infinity, which means that you don't ha uh, they don't follow the law because at that point the law is completely undefined. You know, if you get this one over zero thing, you have no clue as to what that means. Uh, uh, my comments, I guess, are somewhat related to what Ariel was saying. If if cosmologists can speculate a bit, then then I can too. <coughs> Perhaps the, the theory isn't all false or all true. Um, if maybe if we if we could understand what happens when God creates a universe then these problems would be solved. We, we would understand the process that he goes through. Maybe someday we will understand it. Um, and the problem here is, like Ariel said, they've left God out, and specifically they've not understood what happens, what, what is the process he uses to make a universe and to make it function. And if they understood that, then the data would fit together. Well, you know, one of the interesting things, if you look at galaxies, they have these nice, beautiful spiral arms. Uh, some of them are old enough that the spiral arms should have wound around tightly and you should get more of a kind of uh, circular uh, distribution. The, the spiral arms should be all gone. The, the arms look like they haven't made more than one or two revolutions. And that's an interesting coincidence. Um, I agree that I think that this is an attempt to say there's no designer and the problem is that when you do that you project it back and back and eventually you come to the point where it's virtually impossible to deny that there was a designer because the designer had to at the bare minimum make everything absolutely even. Um, for all we know the designer is able to manipulate dark matter to the point where he can get galaxies to form whenever and wherever he pleases. And I think that we've, uh, uh, the, there is a little bit in the whole cosmological attempt, a desperate attempt to explain everything without recourse to any kind of creation whatsoever. And, uh, you know, if you want to believe that that's what's going on, uh, then you can. Uh, but but what, you're, what you're basically doing is you're saying, well, we can explain it without God. And maybe that's just not necessary. Now, of course, one could always say, well, God then would becomes the ultimate fudge factor. Um, but it looks like our attempt to explain it without God already has so many fudge factors in it that I'm not sure that that's necessarily a major uh, drawback. Yes? Uh, most, uh, most scientists agree Most scientists agree that the universe is 13.7 billion years old. I'm reading 
uh, uh, the second book, uh, well, the, bi the bigger book by Piccioni, and he agrees with that. But then he defines the universe as everything we are able to see with the present telescopes we have. So my question is, what's going to happen about the age of the universe and the date of the Big Bang once we get bigger and more powerful telescopes and we are able to see much farther into the universe? Uh, then I suppose the universe expands. Although, to be fair, you, if the Big Bang is correct, we will not be able to see, it is physically impossible to see, beyond the cosmic background radiation. That is the absolute limit of being able to see in the universe. Well, uh, let me ask you this question. If, the uni if what we see is evidence that the universe expanded, then from the point, biblical point of view, wouldn't this make sense to us? Because at some point, God started creating a few galaxies, then they added some more and more and more. Or do we need to assume that what we have in Genesis it relates to the creation of the entire universe. Because notice that the story we find in Genesis makes reference to our days. How about the days in other planets that are totally different? Their days is different. So the story is told for human beings and my preference would be to think or to assume that the Genesis story has to do with the creation of our Earth, our solar system, but probably has nothing to do or very little to do with the creation of the universe. Well, one thing that's fascinating, and we had um, um, Bernard Taylor here and made this point, uh, which... Uh, I thought was interesting, was that if you read the Genesis story, it starts out, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The heaven and the earth is kind of a catchphrase for everything. Now, you have to be a little bit careful, could there be some things that are so far out that we didn't even notice it, and they don't really count. And they didn't count for the people that, that uh, Moses was writing for. But but at least the attempt is being made. God created everything that there was. And then the passage starts out in one of the few places where it does not use the while consecutive. That is to say, instead of saying, if I can translate it literally, and um, it was the earth. Actually, it would be, and it will be, because it changes the tense. Um, and we'll see that in verse 3. But instead, it says, and the earth was. That's a very unusual form, and it really, when you see it in Hebrew narrative most of the time, what it actually means is kind of now the earth was, kind of as a kind of a side-like. Now the earth was without form and void, and then uh, there's another one where you put the uh, you put the uh, the and in front of a noun, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moving upon the waters. So you have three of these kind of not narrative stuff. So setting the stage for a kind of a. a a change in scenery, and then it begins with verse 3, and God said, actually literally, and we'll say God, uh, Elohim. And that's when the narrative proper actually begins. Uh, or, or. Um, there will be light, and there was light. 
perfect uh, example of, of the Lao consecutive taking an imperfect and changing it into a perfect. But so the, the actual narrative starts in, in verse 3. And then it just keeps right on plowing all the way through the rest of the, uh, with no change in the tense. It's the wow uh, imperfect all the way through, with only the exception of uh, one little poetic area that's clearly poetry. And God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. At that point, they don't use that, that narrative form. But other than that, the entire thing is just straight on through. It's always, and did something God, and God made, and made God. And, and that, that Hebrew narrative form carries all the way through without a break through the whole six days. But right at the beginning, there is this, almost like he's saying there's a break here. So you can, if you want to, you can make in the beginning God created the entire universe. Now, an interesting thing of it is, it doesn't say the heavens and the earth were without form. It just says the earth was. And yet the earth includes the firmament of the heavens. And apparently the firmament of the heavens includes the greater light and the lesser light. Almost as if he's saying, well, this is the solar system. So that if you want to picture it that way, it's a perfectly legitimate way to understand the, the passage to say that the stars are out there and God created them whenever. But the sun and the moon and maybe even some of the wandering stars, the planets, were lit up at that point too. That at some point uh, God made either made visible or made proper the greater and the lesser light. And so you can do that. Can I ask you a question? Would that imply that perhaps, and I, I, I'm inclined to think that way, that maybe the six days of creation, the first day of creation started when God said, let there be light, instead of in the beginning, God. I, I think that is a perfectly legitimate way, and uh, certainly um, uh, Bernard Taylor lent his support to that concept as being a legitimate way of reading the passage. So I, I think that, uh, that, that that's, a, that's a proper way. Anyways, we have one here and then one in the back there. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I think you've been waiting patiently. Bernard. Not patiently. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Bernard. <laughs> no, I appreciate the, the uh, <laughs> deceptive openness <laughs> with which you have discussed this today. And I, I think we must respect Marc de Groot's treatment of the Big Bang. I gave a talk in Italy three years ago where he was in the audience. And uh, he came up to me afterwards and made it quite clear that uh, Although he understood the difficulties with the Big Bang, he was, he was impressed and remains to this day impressed by the extent to which the uh, observations in the cosmos fit with the Big Bang. I think you and he are both more open than many people in the, in the physical community and cosmologic community are today. Um, of course, you are familiar, and you referred this morning to, to uh, cold dark matter and uh, dark energy, which account for, what, 95% of the energy in the, in the cosmos? And and depending on the 90, yet, 95, uh, you know, yeah. uh, since you can't see it, what's, you know, 20 times what we already have instead of 10 times? <laughs> well, it, it, doesn't it impress us all to think that that the cosmos cannot be explained except by embracing the existence of entities w for which there has never been found any evidence. It, Purely it, speculation. This is, this is 
You know, this it's is not more than disturbing, <laughs> and we're not the only ones disturbed. Yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing is that I was at one time ar arguing in a, in a, uh, a blog discussion, and, and, asked, and uh, somebody was saying, well, doesn't uh, intelligent design mandate a, uh, a, a divine designer? And I said, for all we know, the designer was part of the dark matter and figured out how to interact with us in in ways that uh, we can't figure out. And you know, who are, to say that design automatically implies omnipotence is just wrong. It may simply imply a uh, uh, you know that's that's not my favorite way of explaining it. But on the other hand, you can't really rule that out. And so you can't say this intelligent design points to, um, points to God and therefore it can't be part of science. Because we don't really know that. I, I would just like, for the <laughs> sake of our good friends here, to mention quickly the, the growing body of serious scientists with no religion to uh, support them, are uh, dismissing the Big Bang as a theory. I attended at Claremont College's, it's several years ago now, uh, a lecture or a series of lectures by Timothy Eastman, who at that time was chief of space physics for NASA. And you know, by that very position, he was a kind of a physics guru for the whole space enterprise of this country. In four hours of lecturing, and I was there, Timothy Eastman dismissed the Big Bang as a bankrupt theory that must be abandoned before this country can make any further progress in serious physics and cosmology. Now this was just one man. In 2004, which is not long ago really, uh, there were over 200 scientists who signed uh, a large advertisement in New Scientist magazine, all pleading for the same thing, namely the abandonment and dismissal of Big Bang Theory as is, well, almost universally embraced and is the starting point for, for higher education these days. And amongst those 200 people, where there were several Nobel Prize winners, there is a serious body of, uh, of opinion that's developing quite impatient with this whole theory. So we are giving it here a very appropriate, uh, balanced and, and judicious look. I think sometimes we can go a little bit too far in being yeah. judicious and give ju judicious room for nonsense. That's all. <laughs> well, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm impressed with is how much of this is, in fact, fudge factors of various kinds. The, the expansion, the appearance of dark matter, the appearance of dark energy are saying there must be something out there because otherwise our predictions don't match reality. Um, well, sometimes that's fair. Um, when Uranus had a, a, an abnormal orbit, didn't fit the standard uh, mathematics, people said, well, maybe there's another planet out there that's influencing it. And sure enough, when they looked in the right direction, they found Neptune. When Neptune had some further uh, abnormalities, they said, well, maybe there's another planet out there. And they looked and they found Pluto. When Mercury had some abnormalities, they said maybe there's a little planet in there called Vulcan. They never found it. And Mercury, the perihelion of Mercury's orbit going around the sun faster than it was expected was one of the key things that led to uh, the validity of uh, general relativity as opposed to uh, standard Newtonian gravity. And so sometimes fudge factors are okay and sometimes they're not. But if every time that a problem, uh, a, a theory gets into trouble, it asks for fudge factors, I have a little trouble with it. 
So uh, I'm, 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 although I, I think that it's interesting that if you go, if you, if you give every possible uh, reasonable uh, 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 benefit of doubt to uh, an atheistic perspective, for our universe, you still come back to a point where the laws of physics don't hold uh, to where something unimaginably, um, unbelievably smooth and even took place. Uh, that, that, that people like Antony Flew are forced into, into deism at that point, and once they accept that, I guess, uh, they, they actually trained a little bit into theism because then you say, well, isn't life the same kind of thing? Uh, but but you have that uh, at the same time I'm not sure that the Big Bang is the final answer and we may find that one of uh, the more uh, conservative uh, uh, positions will have more weight behind it what I would just say just in a moment of closing here I think it's time we gave more serious thought to cosmology and cosmogony uh, the Big Bang story has been the narrative for the creation of the cosmos in scientific circles for many decades now. And in response, creationists have not come up with a credible, coherent narrative account of how the universe began. Now, the, of course, the trouble there is that what is revealed to us is so little, and so the rest would be speculative. But is it unreasonable to think that perhaps the, the cosmic backgr microwave background radiation is indeed an echo of a creation event, but not an atheistic Big Bang, which is commonly defined as a fluctuation in the, in, in the primordial vacuum? You know, it's, it's just words, just words. I mean, it is both... Both descriptions are speculative, necessarily, but, but I think it's time we, we try, to, try to present something that can be narrated and is believable. Well, one of the things that I would like to see is, for example, somebody like Setterfield who has come up with a different kind of cosmology. If they can develop the theory far enough to where they can start making predictions about what you'll find here, and what you find here, and if you look at this star that's so many million years or uh, light years away, that you're going to see this kind of picture. When we see that kind of thing happening, and, and creationists being able to nail prediction after prediction after prediction without having to modify their theory significantly f with fudge factors, I, I think at that point uh, you will see a creationist cosmology is superior to a uh, to the standard cosmology of the time, which is, as we've said, even if you try to go that way, you still wind up being a creationist. It's just a different time frame is all. There is the most promising initiative in this direction, Paul, is uh, what I would call, what is called the plasma universe, where electrical phenomena in the cosmos are shown to be much more powerful than gravity. And, in fact, there's a conference in Las Vegas this coming January on that subject. So. But this, uh, they've got Nobel Prize winners in this, in this field. Okay, um, we have another couple of questions. Before we s do that, I need to point out it's a little past 11.30. Um, and so, uh, Bonnie, and then... You mentioned Jeremiah. And how Jeremiah is parallel with Genesis, where it speaks of without form and void. Yes. If you read on there, it says um, without form and void that there was no more cities, and the birds had fled, and there was no man. And this is taken by Adventists traditionally to mean the time of the millennium, when the earth will have been broken down at the second coming of Christ and is then in a form that is without form and void. Uh, and the well, very same two words. Yeah, it, it gives you the Genesis picture one. of what Tohu Wabohu actually meant. 
So it doesn't have to be that the Earth wasn't there. The Earth could have been there for, what, billions of years, but in the same you know, unusable state as, say, the Moon or Mars or something, waiting for God to start Creation Week. Yes, that, that is a distinct possibility. Um, we have one in the back that uh, didn't get it. Can you pass the mic back? Well, it's uh, it's partly because we're recording this, and we want okay. uh, people on the internet to be able to understand what you have to say too. I think sometimes we are trying to be more antagonistic than we need to be, and maybe that's again uh, a time. No, that's that's the signs of the times in which we are living now where in political realms and religious realms and science realms, there's more conflict at times than there would be, and less discussion and intelligent discussion between different camps than there is. Um, I think we have two books in essence, the book of nature and the book of revelation as in the inspired word. And in the end, both will, will lead to one truth. The way of science is not the way of, of doctrine, where you come up with a certain preposition and then the facts have to fit it. Sometimes that is done in science, but that's usually not good science. You get at a certain point through trial and error, and theories are being developed and changed, but that's the way of science. And I think as, um, as believers, one shouldn't be so antagonistic about that way of how things are being done, because in time, things change. The theories which were held 100 years ago are not completely held like that today. They are refined and being changed. And how the cosmos began, in essence, science is trying to find out how God did the work. For believers, it is enough to say God did it, uh, but human curiosity, and I think it's important that we have that, wants to know how did it happen. And um, that's a different way of approaching it. And I think at times, let's just have a little bit of patience at times and, um, and see how things are being developing. Well, I think you're partly right on that, except that there are people who approach that with Whatever happened, it wasn't this. And if pressed, the reason why is because God didn't interfere, either because God's a non-interfering God. That's a theistic evolution kind of, uh, uh, the new theistic evolution, not the old one. Or because, um, or because there really is no God. And I don't think we'll ever, uh, unless uh, Dawkins or Hitchens or uh, Dennett or some of those other people change their minds, I don't think we will have agreement with, between them and us. And one of the things that's been done with science is it has been claimed by those people that science is objective. That means that all reasonable people, and I'm a reasonable person, must agree on um, uh, what is happening. And the statement is being made in spite of the fact that for some of these people, in terms of what's happening with God, they're not reasonable people at all. They hate the God that they hear about. You can hear it dripping from uh, Dawkins' comments about God being a, uh, uh, finishes up with sadomasochistic bully. Um, and uh, the ones in front of that are, are uh, you know, a, a whole paragraph's worth of, of lists in, in one sentence of bad things. So he doesn't want God involved. And if you, refuse to, if you refuse to allow God in, then you're not going to see it when God does something because you don't want to see it. And so basically, when you start out that way, 
you're not an objective scientist. That is true. I mean, you have apologetics on both sides. And you just mentioned one which is very strong on his side. And, uh, but the danger that I see is that when people start shouting, they shout so loud that they don't see the evidence anymore. And uh, I think on both sides, and even in the side of atheists or agnostics, one can find people which are open-minded. You never know what the issues are which lead a person to be closed-minded. I don't know, but maybe the reason for that particular person. Yeah, and, and you know, I think, that, I think that you may be right, and I think that Anthony Flew may be an illustration of that very point, is that eventually, even in spite of his feelings about how God was not necessary and how God's followers were not doing a very good job of it and so forth, um, that he came to the conclusion that there must be a God. He still doesn't like the Christian God, and the interesting reason is because he can't buy eternal torment. I'm with him there. Uh, eternal torment. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, one more question, and I think we'll call it a day for, for now. Okay, you made reference to a statement by somebody who said, defined the Big Bang a moment when nothing exploded into everything. Now, my Bible says that explains this as God creating ex nihilo. Scientists say this is myth. Th this doesn't make sense. No uh, educated person should believe that. <laughs> but they say nothing cre exploded into everything. And I'm supposed to accept that is a scientific explanation. Yeah, and that's one of the interesting things is that the Big Bang is the worst case scenario for, for a religious person and it turns out to be not that bad. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, um, the Big Bang says first there was nothing, then there was everything. Uh, Genesis 1 says God created the heavens and the earth um, it doesn't explicitly say out of nothing, but it does use the word bara, which kind of implies that. And, and uh, certainly in, um, in Hebrews, it talks about things that are made out of things, uh, things that are seen are made out of things that are not seen. And we believe that by faith. But the scientists are backed into the same corner. They believe that things that are seen are made out of things that are not seen. And it's worse than that because the scientists are now forced to agree that there are things that are not seen that are still around. Mm -hmm. That's what you call dark matter. And those are not seeable. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, that both sides come to the same general conclusion at the end. Uh, and I think it is important for us not to prematurely give up on uh, what's going on with, the, uh, with a, a scientific theory because sometimes you give it a little time and the scientific theory will come around. It, what you have to realize is that the Big Bang came out of a picture of the universe as being eternal. Uh, that was the Lucretius universe. That was the Epicurus universe. That it was always atoms rattling around and they just happened to come together. And see, with infinite time, you have infinite chance. And so we're just lucky chances that we're here. Uh, that's, that is the Epicurean universe. Well, it kept on going and going and going. And the Big Bang actually was a huge shift. shift. Uh, depending on whose side you're on, forwards or backwards, um, that the shift was that suddenly we don't have a universe that goes back and back forever. That it goes back 13.7 or 12 or 20 or something. I think the shortest that I've seen was 8, and the longest I've seen is 21. 
But it, at some point it came back and it met at a point and that was the end, period. Well, um, if that's really the case, then, um, then the, uh, the, the, asser the assertion that the physical universe had a beginning at a point in time is suddenly confirmed by science um, in a way that nobody really expected. Time frame is off. But the existence of an absolute beginning to not only matter and energy, but to space and time themselves uh, is now something that science has had to deal with, had to accept. And the only way you can get around this is to say, well, there's actually meta-universes. Uh, that, that beyond our universe is another one that created this one. Um, and of course it created hundreds of, well, actually hundreds of orders of magnitudes of universes. Uh, some people will say an infinite number of universes. Um, you can either do that or you can have one God. I don't know. To me, uh, Occam's razor at, at uh, millions and millions, millions and millions of millions of millions of millions of millions of universes, and one God. Mm, pretty easy to make that decision. It doesn't seem to be an argument of, about facts. I'm sorry. Oh, I say it doesn't seem to be an argument about facts and real science anymore. It's really about beliefs. And that's and belief true. Belief systems. And that's absolutely yeah. true. And when when you realize that, you realize that. There's no reason to prefer their beliefs to ours because they, uh, you know, they have, the, I guess, the majority of the scientific community. But, you know, if the majority of the scientific community is antagonistic to the idea of God to begin with, uh, then, then they're biased. And so if you're talking about that, then uh, if you try to be fair and unbiased, it looks like you're probably better off with God. If we're going to be looking at beginnings, perhaps we shouldn't forget John chapter 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, which speaks of the beginning of beginnings, uh, yes. before there was anything else. Yes. It speaks about God being there to begin with, which is fascinating. And how it describes God is as the word. What does that mean? Well, that means, in, in my finite understanding, information. That means information preceded matter. That, there's an interesting parallel between that and Proverbs, where it talks about wisdom. And the thought of Logos and the thought of... Uh, now, Sophia is a Greek, and I can't remember what the uh, Hebrew term was, are, are really not that much different. And the idea is, uh, you know, from Proverbs is wisdom. God made everything with the use of me. Seems like uh, science, well, let's say so-called science, <laughs> however it defines itself, um, or the majority it defines itself, and religion is will kind of never be one. You know, uh, well, for one thing, science is based on proof, so you have to prove the existence of God. Even if even if God uh, came down, and, you know, you'd still have the naysayers, or you'd you know you'd still have the the different ways of to looking at the data and. I don't. I don't really. Realistically, I don't think it's ever going to uh, prove the existence of God, and it, it probably is not going to prove. At least in our lifetime, for sure, I don't think it's going to prove the existence of any other way that creation was uh, happened. You know. Well, it's true uh, that that uh, we don't have uh, that we won't have the kind of proof that you have in mm -hmm. mathematics. 
although we've found out that uh, mathematics isn't as, as rigorous a proof as we thought either. Uh, it's a fascinating chapter by uh, Lekatosh that, that outlines uh, that, and if you read it, you just go, well, we don't really know what we think we know. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, um, you know, if you're talking about that kind of proof, I can't prove that you're there, and vice versa. And I think that the best philosophy I've seen actually is a, if I remember right, the guy's name is Thomas Reed, uh, who was a uh, contemporary of Hume's. And uh, I don't know how to pronounce that anyway, Hume or Hume? Um, anyway, um, and, uh, and basically, you know, said, hey, we know there are people out there. You can't prove it, but we know that. And we know that they think in certain ways, and we know that, that they exist, but it's not a proof kind of knowing. It's not the kind of thing that you couldn't philosophically deny if you wanted to. Uh, but if you're trying to be reasonable, you assume that there are people out there. The reason I'm talking is because I think you're all listening. Um, and uh, uh, that, that you can derive intelligence from the looking at the product. And of course, that means that intelligent design is legitimate because it's just an extension of what we do all the time. And you know, the problem, the real problem is that there are people in science who have decided they really don't want God anywhere near. They have wrapped this in science and tried to sell it to us. And most of the time, what they say makes a certain amount of sense. And sometimes they can make some spectacular things by using assumptions like that, uh, such as get people to the moon and on occasion uh, cure cancer. Although not as well as they would like to have us believe. And we still have cancers that resolve for no obvious reason. Um, uh, but, the important thing is that I think that if we approach uh, with a neutrality towards whether there could be God or not, that viewing science reasonably objectively, it pushes us into belief in God. That's, I think, the subject of uh, Ariel's book, Science Discovers God, is that in some cases, even when they didn't want to, they still wound up with evidence that there was a God. Um, but if, if you steel yourself hard enough, you can force this away. But that's not our job. Our job is to find out the truth, not to try to slant it towards the direction we're going. And I think that as creationists, we need to be a little bit careful about that too. When we present our scientific findings, we need to present them in a non-advocacy um, way, if I can put it that way. That we show this and we show that, and then we allow people to make up their minds because I, I think that when we, start, when we start trying to preach from our own selves, people will say, well, you're just a Christian, it doesn't matter. When we say, well, look at this in nature, how do you deal with that from a non-theistic or a non-short age or whatever point of view? And I think that when we, when we were able to allow the facts to speak for themselves, and, and that's really part of what we're talking about when we say that we're supposed to be witnesses and not attorneys, that we simply say, what happened to us? Then, you know, if you don't, like it well you can you can ignore it you know it's not my job to convince you it's my job to present the evidence and then after that it's your job to listen